was about five years of age. Um, I used to go to Sunday school um, and we used to learn a lot about Christianity and um, I always knew there was a God, you know. Um, didn't know who God was, but I knew there was a God. Um, and then later on in life I took um, religious education studies in high school. Um, and I, f I, I, I suppose I, I, I didn't really do too much research at the time. Um, there was a couple of books that I read, um, basically, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it now, but there was one sort of uh, group of Christians that, um, Seven Day Event Evangelists or something like that. Um, so I read a book on that, I found that quite interesting. Um, to be honest, as a teenager, teenagers just do their own thing. They're not a lot of them aren't interested in these uh, religions. But then, as I got older, when I was about nineteen, my mother started looking into um, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and then she um, she actually called me and said that, you know, they're starting to come to her house to give the studies and I told her to be very careful because I've heard that they brainwash. Um, and then I started to quote some biblical verses to my mother to say, well, ask them this and ask them that because I knew certain parts of the Bible, you know, why are they saying one thing when the Bible says another? And so they asked me to go along to speak to them and so I spoke to them for a while and we had a long discussion and they were basically telling me about the end of time, what was going to happen, what's already happened, what's predicted in the Bible and so forth. And this intrigued me, you know, um, still does, but this is something that, that, that did intrigue me and, and, and they lived a good life, they were quite, you know, um, nice people. So I decided that's where I was going, you know. Um, so I took up um, being a Jehovah's Witness, and I was a Jehovah's Witness for about four years. Uh, my mother still is a Jehovah's Witness. Um, then I met my husband, and we got married. I came out of the religion of Jehovah's Witness. They kind of disfellowshipped me, <laughs> didn't talk to me ever again. Um, but, you know, um, my mother and myself, we, we didn't speak for many years afterwards, but we've got a very good relationship now, so alhamdulillah. Um, and then I didn't really, you know, I was so upset with religion, you know, and, and things that went on in my life, I just kind of ignored it for about eight years. Um, and then one day I was in a meat shop and I saw all the prophets' names on the wall and I was so amazed. It was like, what? You believe in these prophets? I mean, eight years <laughs> being a Muslim and didn't know that, you know? Um, and at the time, there wasn't really a lot of help for reverts. It's not like today. People have woke up, they realise that, you know, people are coming into Islam and stuff. So there wasn't really a lot of help. And I was really amazed by that. I didn't realise that the same prophets that Christians believe in, all the prophets I was told about, Islam holds dear too. So then I um, decided to start looking into it and the more I looked into it, the more I could see, oh my, I've had this in my hands for eight years and I've done nothing with it and realised then that this was what I've been looking for all my life, you know. Then, you know, subhanAllah, my sister-in-law, I call her my sister-in-law because she's actually married to, sorry, my brother is married to her sister, okay, so um, this is how it it went and she used to come visit me because um, she lives locally and she was one day she was sort of really down and she said I'm thinking of going back to church you know because um, she could see I was starting to change and that and I said to her why don't you look into Islam you know and I explained a few things to her and then she was like that's where I want to be, that's what I want to do. I, I, I want to take my shahada and I went, oh, hold on, <laughs> I don't know how to do this because I was still naive myself. So I took her to somebody and they said, oh, she's got to learn more first. So we went away and uh, she said to me, then I'm going to do it by myself. 
because I know this is right and that's what I want. So I said, hold on, let me make a phone call. We made a phone call and um, to you know one of my friends and I said, look, she's going to do it by herself. If you don't do it, she's going to become a Muslim, you know, without your help. So that's when they decided to get a Mulana to, to, for her to take a Shahada. Then I felt a huge responsibility towards her. How could I tell her anything about Islam if I wasn't doing it myself? So on went my scarf, you know. I felt silly, I'm going to be honest, at first, when I first put a scarf on. I thought, oh God, all my neighbours going to laugh at me, you know. But you know what? The minute I walked out the door, it was like so natural, so normal, you know. So then, you know, I started to practice a lot more. And of course, my sister-in-law was asking me many, many questions. And I, I, I kind of used to stay up till three o'clock in the morning researching, you know. It's something I've always done anyway. Um, and so I would find the answers, then I'd go back to her, show her, you know. Um, and that strengthened me. Um, then um, I realised that there was a few things wrong. Um, I started to argue with some of my friends because hadith weren't adding up. Um, the thing, some of the nasty things that they were saying and they were calling this Muslim a kafir and that Muslim a kafir and I'm saying you can't call Muslims kafir, no matter what. There was others saying, you know, oh, the, the, the bombings were, you know, um, y y you don't blame. And I'm saying, no, our Prophet, peace be upon him, forbid us from doing any harm to another person, another human being. This is not what the Prophet, peace be upon him, brought. And so there was lots and lots of arguments. Um, but I was still doing my research and then um, I went to a charity shop, um, got a book called Then I Was Guided. Um, I thought it was about reverts and I thought, yeah, great, nice book to, you know, dig my teeth into, see what other reverts do and so forth. And I started to read it and I was really, really genuinely horrified to see that Fatima was angry with Abu Bakr. It's not told. You, you never hear that, you know. Um, and this was only about three years ago, so you can imagine all those years being a Muslim and never hearing that, you know. So I, I researched again, um, checked through everything, could see that this is correct. There's many, many hadith in, um, I think there's about five in Bukhari alone that show that Fatima was angry with Abu Bakr. I came across other hadith where Muhammad وسلم, said, um, those who anger Fatima anger me, those who anger Fatima anger Allah, those who anger me anger Allah, you know. And so I thought, well, there is definitely something wrong, but I was still uncomfortable with changing. So I put the book away, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. Um, and I knew that some of my friends would not be my friends anymore. Um, and and it was, I was teaching at the time as well. I had a huge responsibility because I had a class of 22 reverts. And the reason I was doing that is because I had quite a uh, strange journey, really, trying to learn about Islam, and there was nothing there for me. I even got told by one Muslim that um, it was too late to teach me because I taught myself how to read. You know, and, and like I asked another Muslim how to do rakat, and they turned around and said, have you got books? And I said, yes, we'll go and learn then. You know, and it's like, well, two years I spent trying to work out what a rakat was, because I didn't know, you know, so I had it quite hard looking into Islam. Um, but, so I, I, I decided that, you know, um, I would teach other reverts. It's, it's a good thing because at the end of the day I can now help others because of my experiences. Um, and then, um, so yeah, I, I kind of just ignored the book, ignored what I'd read, very uncomfortable with it, very uncomfortable. And then a year later, it was about a year later that um, I had um, I'd, I'd started watching a program called The Arrivals and by the 30th chapter, I think it was, 31st, they started to show that all of the Prophet, peace be upon him, descendants were slaughtered and again I'd never heard this and I thought there's got to be more to this, you know, there has to be more. So um, I approached one of my students um, that had approached me prior to, to look into Shiism and I said, 
to her, look, should we look together? You know, um, and I was still scared because, you know, you hear about brainwashing and all the rest of it. I've already been down that road with, you know, um, other religions. And so it, it, was, um, it was a bit scary, you know, especially as I know the reaction of some people. Then I, um, you know, the more I looked into it, the more I could see this is the truth. This is, this is the right way. And I really did do a lot of research, you know. Um, I've got a huge folder full of evidences. Um, I, I, I use the Arlen. Um, it's a CD that you put into um, a computer to do a lot of my research because you can actually go to the search engine and you can um, type in any, any words and, and a lot of hadith will come up. So I spent a long time going through all of these. You know, when I came away from being a Jehovah's Witness, I actually turned my back on God and I felt so empty, really, really empty, you know. I felt that, you know, I'd been following something that, that wasn't correct, you know, and I was sick and tired of the lies, you know. And so I, I really did just turn my back on, on God. And I, you know, um, I just needed God back in my life. Um, I, I'd taken my shahada because I'd got married. I didn't actually take it because I wanted to be a Muslim, I'm going to be honest, you know. And we, you know, we, we didn't really, there wasn't many people that were practicing Islam around us um, at the time. So um, I just sort of, I mean, obviously we ate halal and things like that, but. That I, I didn't even know how to pray, <laughs> so, you know, um, but it was when I realised that everything that I'd learned um, as a Christian, you know, that some of it was correct and that the prophets um, that Islam teaches us about are, are the prophets that I knew and grew up with. And so that's really what triggered me into looking more into Islam. Um, I think once I started looking, um, you know, I just read a couple of books and I, um, I started to read the Quran. I couldn't understand it, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I, I kind of put, put the Quran back up on, on, on top of the wardrobe and, and I a couple of months later, I brought it back down to try and understand it, and I put it back up on the wardrobe. And then we moved from a tower block into a house, and um, our next door neighbours were um, they were Ahmadis. Okay, they didn't tell me they were Ahmadis, um, and they were trying to help me in Islam. Um, but they started to laugh at me when I, you know, they gave me the prayers to look at, and um, they they. They kind of didn't tell me that, that that's what they were. Um, I've nothing against them, but they were really mean to us for a few years, um, really mean. Um, but they, you know, they taught me how to do my salah, and then they laughed when I first did my salah. You know, when they taught me how to do one line of, say, um, Surah Fatiha, because the way I, I they, they ticked a book and they kind of um, gave me the book and went, right, learn that, those words. And of course, you, you get an English person learning Arabic, mm. and it sounds funny, but you don't laugh at them, you know? It, it, and, and I was embarrassed by that, you know? And she used to call her friends in and say, listen to this, you know? And they, they would make fun of me. And I was like, oh my God, if this is, you know, Islam, then, you know, I just kind of stopped talking to them. So, um, and so anyway, um, they, um, I, I pulled myself away from them, but I still continued with Islam. My son, Usman, was um, in junior school at the time, and he had become friends with a uh, Muslim boy. And so I took him, uh, well, they came for tea, and then I took the young lad back to his home because I didn't want him walking on his own. And so the mum called me in and asked me, you know, and um, she's heard that I'm Muslim. Um, and she, to be honest with you, you know what, she really helped me, really helped me a lot um, to try and teach me a little bit about Islam. They weren't 
practicing much at the time, but she helped me with whatever she knew. But sadly, over the years, they became, uh, they started to follow what they call the way of the self. And they, the more extreme they got, the more they pointed a finger at me and my family. And so we kind of parted ways, sadly. It hurt, I'm going to be honest, because I really loved that family. Um, and I really, really loved that family. I, I heard a quote from um, Yusuf Islam, um, Cat Stevens, mm. um, once, and I went, well, yeah, that's exactly how I think. If I knew the Muslims prior to me knowing Islam, I would never be a Muslim. And, and that's how sad the state of affairs was at that time. It's not like that now, yeah? But at that time, people were not awake. They were very much asleep. Islam was asleep. And yes, I did get a lot of racism. I got a lot of um, people turning me away, you know? To the extent that I had to teach myself how to read Arabic, you know? Um, I took my boys to learn, and every now and again, I'd call my son Bilal over and go, well, what does that mean, you know? And then I'd have to know it, because children, they tell you once and that's it, you know, they go off and do their own thing. So it, it was hard, you know. Um, so yes, there was quite a lot of people that weren't quite nice. I had people that I would say salam to and they would just give me a dirty look, you know, as if to say, well, you know, why are you saying salam to me? See, what, what happened was when I was um, being taught by the Ahmadis, I actually picked the Quran up again for the third time. And on this occasion, I understood it. And I cried and cried and cried until I could no longer read it. It was, and the feeling that I got over me was just crazy, you know, um, amazing. And I knew what I was reading was right. It was Allah speaking to me, it was God speaking to me. And, 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 and it jumps out from the Quran. I, I, that sounds crazy, I know, but it really does, you know. And so, Whatever people do, it doesn't matter because people are people at the end of the day, okay? I'm not perfect. Nobody is perfect. We all make mistakes. We all do things that we don't sometimes realise that, that may affect another person. Um, so no, I, I, that, it didn't put me off. No, definitely not. Um, but there was occasions where I just couldn't be bothered with people, you know. Um, yeah, sadly. You know what, I tell you, really, truly, I can genuinely hand on heart say that my kids, my children, have grown up in a really good manner. Islam taught me how to bring my children up in a beautiful way. They've never smoked. They've never had, um, you know, they, there's never been any problems with alcohol. Um, they're just decent. Decent kids, you know. I mean, if you look around you, even my son Bilal, he came home from college one day and he said to me, Mom, if you knew, yeah, what the Muslim boys were doing and saying and, and getting up to in college, you'd pull your heart out, you know? Yeah. Because this is the way some um, people are. And, and, and they, you know, Islam actually, when you, when you, when you take Islam for what it truly is, y your life can, can be peaceful. You know, everything in Islam is there. <clears throat> Sorry. Everything in Islam is there to protect you as a, as a person, you know, as a family unit, as a, as a society. And, you know, if you really follow it properly, then, you know, yes, you're going to get your hiccups, you're going to get things that go wrong, but not, not in general. You know, everything is peaceful. It's, you don't bring anything upon yourself, let's say. I don't know if that makes sense, you know, so... Positive, yeah, definitely. You know, I I look at my life and I'm I'm really content. I'm really peaceful. You know, I I have you know illness and things like that. But yeah, I'm I'm, I'm I would say I'm I'm content. I don't have to worry about my kids. I don't you know they've grown up. They they they've become adults. They they you know they're good children. They're good to me. My sons have never said half to me. That's what Islam teaches, mm. you know. I wasn't like that as a teenager, you know. In fact, my mum now says, bless her, she says, oh, it's because you've grown up. <laughs> because I don't talk to her in the way I used to, stuff for Allah, you know. But she doesn't see it's Islam that's changed me. She sees that it's me growing up, you know. Um,
Do you remember? Okay. okay. And then you have your drawing panel. Yeah, your long fatter, sorry. Yeah, you know that so well. Okay. You know that it's two counts, okay? When you see the um, dhamma changing into a, the opposite, you know that because of the stru uh, struggle that I had um, through my through my path, um, I felt that um, there was a huge gap in support for the birds. Um, and so I started a dower store, uh, I joined a dower store and I, I was there for about a year. Um, and um, I met somebody there that was interested in Islam and so we started to meet once a week to have coffee at, um, at the market and um, you know she was asking me questions I would answer them and then eventually I took her to the mosque um, and they, she took a shahada there and so I mentioned to the brothers that there was this lack of support in the community for reverts and that something more was needed and so um, they decided to allow me to open a class to help reverts um, and so I did this for quite some time and I ended up with 22 revert sisters that I was teaching and they were asking lots and lots of questions I was teaching them how to do their salah, um, how to do their wudu, um, reading Arabic um, and um, general basic questions and answers but you know, I, I found some of the questions I weren't able to answer, so I asked them to write them down. We'd take it to a scholar and then come back the next week with the answers. Um, but um, unfortunately, I, I, I just felt that w when I came to the path of Ehel Obeid, I really felt that I was not teaching them right, and so I felt that I couldn't do it no, no longer. I, also, my illness, um, I had to take that into consideration as well because it was quite far for me to go. Um, but it was mainly to do with that. I couldn't, I, I, how can you teach somebody to pray if you really know when you've done your research that it's wrong? You know? How can you teach somebody um, to do their wudu when you've done your research and you know that that is wrong? So I was like, to, I have to go, you know, but I was able to talk to some of my students and there was quite a few of them that actually came with me to research Ehl Obeid and they actually, you know, did um, do, do research with me, I held classes here, we, you know, we, we've all got folders with, with all the evidences in that we've done the research. Um, and it was when I left there, you know, by Allah's grace, you know, I come out of one mosque and Allah put me in another mosque and now I teach children um, in a Shia mosque and it's really, really nice. Um, and I still teach some reverts, you know, in my home, they come to me. Um, I, when I, one thing, you know, that, that because I taught myself how to read, um, in Arabic, I had to polish it up, you know, so then I eventually um, went to some classes at the mosque and um, I, um, I started to learn Tajweed, yeah, because I, I actually sounded like a frog when I was reciting the Quran, it was quite appalling. <laughs> um, but I learned all the rules and I started to practice, 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 and eventually, you know, alhamdulillah, I I, st I started to read properly and that I was able then to teach on where I am now. Um, I actually, when I first went to the mosque to ask them to help me uh, to learn Tajweed, they were all reading and they were reading really nice and then I didn't realise I'd have to read out loud and I thought, oh my goodness, they're going to send me away just like they always have done before. And I actually cried with frustration but they didn't, alhamdulillah, they didn't send me away. And that's how I was able to learn more so that I could teach it more. And that's why I'm so passionate about teaching. Um, it, you know, there are hadith, many hadith, I'm sure, I can't quote any off the top of my head at the moment, which where the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, um, they all taught, um, if you know something, pass it on. 
you know. There's an old um, ancient Chinese proverb that goes, um, if you're preparing for a week, sow rice. If you're preparing for a season, plant a tree. But if you're preparing for your life, teach, you know. And, 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 and that really sums up why I teach. I, I, I want to support the reverts. I want to show other people, you know, what I know. I want to be able to um, pass it because I, I have a muscle disorder and the only thing I've got left that I can do is my brain and I keep, you know, like hunting when I have one so I'm able to pass on whatever I have with that so yeah, teaching is what I do. You know, um, what I found um, is there were so so many um, misconceptions, you know. I had people say, stay away from the shear, they spit in your food. Stay, <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, honestly. And, and, and stay away from them, they brainwash you. Stay away from them, they beat themselves, you know. Stay away from them this reason, stay away from them that reason. None of it's true. When you actually look and you ask a shear, you know, um, and, and you get to know somebody that follows a hello bait, you realise, hang on a minute, it's, it, this is all put out there to stop people looking into Shias and definitely, you know, it's all rumours and, and, and it's horrible, you know. But yes, I weren't able to approach people with it. One, I was afraid because I'd already had some attitude from certain people um, regarding it. Two, why do I need it? I've got so much evidence from Sunni books, you know. And to be honest with you, when you ask, when you look, I even done research on the internet and I looked at, you know, what the Sunnis have to say and answer to what the Shia have to say. And, and, and their arguments are so weak, you can see right through them, you know. The, the, the arguments that they have to say, you know, why certain things happen, why these things are in, the, in, in their hadith. Nothing I said. So why would I need to ask, you know, somebody that I, in a mosque that I was going to, and you know, um, because they wouldn't have had the answers anyway. You know. After I'd read, then I was guided on the first occasion. Um, I really w was uncomfortable with um, the fact that I knew that something was wrong. Um, and the fact that I was ignoring it, I, I was uncomfortable with myself. I was quite horrified to see that uh, Bibi Fatima uh, salam, had a, an argument with one of the caliphs and I asked somebody about it and they just said that it was um, because Bibi Fatima didn't understand that um, her father didn't leave anything in a will. And you know, that wasn't an answer for me. Because she would know, she, you know, are they saying that, 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 that somebody who was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was unfamiliar with, with, with how things were, you know, and, and she would know if something was left in a will or it wasn't left in a will, you know, and, and to say that a caliph would know better than her, it just didn't add up. But I still found it quite hard to look any further. I was actually scared because my whole life was going to change and I knew that. I knew that I would no longer have some of the friends that I had, sadly. Um, and I kind of thought that even my family may um, not accept it. And then I would be literally isolated. So it was a huge, huge thing that I had to take into consideration. But I always felt I wasn't true to me. I wasn't true to myself because I knew there was something wrong and I was leaving it. And I left it on the shelf. I couldn't return the book. Um, it wasn't a loaned book, um, but I, 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 I couldn't even get rid of the book. Um, I just felt that I needed it. I don't know why, but I just felt I couldn't get rid of that book. Um, then, I, you know, then I was guided. Um, and, and I just dismissed it after that. It was more comfortable for me to just leave it in the back of my mind than, than actually do any more research, because um, I knew it was coming with a lot of 
consequences. Um, and then it was literally a year later when I um, when I'd actually seen that some of the uh, family had been slaughtered. Um, some of the Prophet uh, family was literally slaughtered and it was like, why? You know, I'm quite a suspicious person anyway. I look into everything and I make sure of everything and I actually ask a lot of questions, maybe some uncomfortable ones. In fact, I had one um, Sunni say to me once, don't look too deep into things, you know? And, and, and that for me is like, mm -mm. I, you, you know, as I even had somebody say to me once, um, you shouldn't have these books. I used to have some Sufi books as well, um, because I, I don't mind reading anything. I'm not afraid to read anything, you know? And so they would say, no, people will think you're this, people will th think you're that. So I had an argument with that person over that because I said, no, you know, um, if, if somebody is afraid, yeah, for you to go and do research, it means that there's something wrong with their beliefs. That's how I feel. Because, you know, at the end of the day, what's true is true and what's wrong is wrong. And, you, and, and for you to, as a human being, to be able to decipher that, yeah, you need to be able to read. You shouldn't ever put one book to a side. You should read everything and not be afraid to read everything, you know? Um, that, you know, so... Anyway, getting back to what I was saying about the, um, the fact that I just left it um, to one side. Um, I couldn't get rid of it. And, as I said, when I saw that these people had been slaughtered, there had to be more. How did so many family members yeah, get slaughtered, one after the other, murdered even, one after the other, without there being a cover-up somewhere? There had to be a cover-up, you know? And that's why I ended up um, doing more research. I had to, um, because that's how I am. Um, and the more I looked into it, the more I could see it was the truth the more I could um, the more I could um, I could actually ha gain evidences from the Sunni books you know it's like it, it wasn't even from the Shia books it was all from the Sunni books there wasn't just evidences from the Sunni books there's even evidence in the Bible if you look you know um, and, and, and so I knew, at that point I knew I couldn't go back. I could not go back to, to the way I, the, to what I believed before. Um, so I decided to take my Shahada again. Um, there is a, an, an, you know, some people may go, oh, yeah, you know, the Shahada is the Shahada. But you know, at the end of the day, yes it is, I'll agree with that. You know, whatever the Prophet, peace be upon him, taught us, that's what we should follow. Um, but just to add something on is not going to send me to hellfire, now is it, you know? So I added that Ali is the friend of Allah because I felt that I needed to just state that from my tongue to know that, yes, Ali was a friend of Allah's and, and yes, there are many enemies of Allah. So, and, and, and that was my reasoning behind it. Um, and so I became... And Shia, and came to the path of Ehl al-Bayt, and I've never, never regretted it, because the more I look into it, the more I can see, yeah, this is the path, this is what I was talking about when I had all those arguments, you know, about how you should conduct yourself as a person, as a human being, you know, how you should treat yourself, how you should treat other people, you know, how you should conduct yourself in a peaceful manner. You know, not go out there going, this one's kafir and that one's kafir and you shouldn't talk to this one because of this and you shouldn't talk to... No, 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 no. We never heard a prophet, our prophet, peace be upon him, ever talking badly, you know, in, in those kind of manners. And I think, you know, if you truly are a searcher of the truth, and, and, and I mean this, go do your research. Look at how our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was. Look at his family, how they behaved. And then then you'll see the true path of Islam and then you won't have the negativities in your life that you already have and I think some of you know what I'm talking about. This is actually um, a compilation that I've 
uh, you know, compiled about hadith and different notes um, to, to, to show the evidences that I've um, taken from when I was uh, from the Sunni uh, books. Lots of my students now come to me and, and, and we've actually compiled them together. I've, I've made a few also for um, some uh, Shia sisters that uh, w wanted this as well. Um, because everything in here, or most of what's in here, is from Sunni sources. Um, for instance, I spoke earlier about Fatima and how she was angry. And there is one place in here, if you just bear with me, that I can show you, that shows... Just bear with me on this. Okay, here it is. You have a hadith from um, Sahih al-Bukhari, as they wrote it here, hadith number 61.5, and it's narrated by al Miswa bin Mahrama, and it says, Allah's apostle said, Fatima is a part of me, and he who makes her angry makes me angry. And you can see there's many, many, many hadith speaking of the argument that she had. And there's one in particular where it says, um, I'll just read this portion to you here. Therefore, again, this is narrated by Aisha. This is in Al-Bukhari and this is hadith number 8.718. And it says here, therefore, Fatima left the caliph and did not speak to him till she died um, and there's lots more you, you know there are so many in, in Bukhari and Abu Dawud and places like that where it shows that she was angry you know um, another just a quick point you know the, the 12 imams when I saw that they were all slaughtered um, I started to do a little bit of research on those and one thing that was really, really interesting was that they're mentioned in the Bible. And so I have a place here where I have the 12 Imams, if you just bear with me. I've sectioned them all off so that I know um, really where to go and find the places. Now this is in um, uh, Genesis chapter 17, verse 20, and there are many, many different Bibles. You know, you've got the World English Bible, the Young Literal Translation, the English Revised Version, the Derby Bible, and so forth. And then more on this page, and you've got the uh, American Standard Bible, the New Living Translation, you've got the King James Bible, which everybody knows, and I'll read from that one um, in particular. And it says this, and as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him and made him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. Who are the twelve princes that the Bible speaks of? This isn't Isaac, I'm pointing out here Ishmael. Ishmael was the other son of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. And so... You know, even the Bible will tell you that there were 12 princes coming. What you need to ask is, who are they? There are some scholars, and I have some evidences here that show that they say that there was... Um, because our Prophet, peace be upon him, mentions um, that they will all be from the Quraysh, they, they actually mention a few names. And they come to about... Um, there's a famous scholar called Ibn Kathir, and they come to, um, he, he came to a point where he'd got, got four or five um, uh, people that he um, said were the, 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 the 12 princes or the 12 caliphs to come from the Quraysh. But he can't go any further and what he says is they're to come. Well, I'd, if that's the truth, then I'd like to know when. Confusing. Or not if you actually look into it and you find out that there has been 12 imams and sadly most people don't even know them so yeah anyway I compiled this and 
lots and lots of um, uh, people have this now because I do lots of uh, classes on it and I also give them out um, when I can um, as gifts so it's and, and it's it's getting fuller by the day because I'm always doing research it never ends never ends there's always something to add to it story that happened to me um, when I first came to this path um, you know I used to spend so many hours studying 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 and I, I could quote so many hadith you know and then when I came to this path I thought oh dear I've gone and studied and it's been a waste of time and I was so upset by that because the knowledge that I had was now all gone because I didn't know what was right and what was wrong anymore and it troubled me a lot. And then I had a dream, I think it was on the ninth night of Muharram. And um, a man came to me with the, the most amazing, amazing eyes, piercing, really, really. And he said, why, very peaceful looking. He said, why are you troubled? What, what? You don't need anything but this. And he handed me a red and gold book. And I already had this given to me by a, a, a young lady that helped me called Salwa. Um, she's been absolutely amazing, um, a, a huge support. And basically she'd given me this as a gift when I first started looking into um, the path of Ehlul Bayt. But I put it on the side, I mean I, it was just a, a book to me at the time. Um, and I didn't realise the importance of it and then, you know, she, um, as I said, she gave me this book and I put it away and then I didn't look at it even a year later, you know, I thought, how can a book with the wild in it be all I need? I didn't, it made no sense to me. But what was interesting was that about a day or so later I saw a picture of an artist's impression of Hussein, alayhi salam. Subhanallah, it was so much like him. Maybe the chin was slightly different, but that was the same person that came in that dream to me. And and for a year, I was puzzled by why would a book of du'as be all I need. When I've read this book, a year later, because I do take my time sometimes, um, subhanAllah, it's, it's, it's written by his son, Iman Zain al -Abidin. And it's like, wow, subhanAllah, you know, he's given me a book that's written by his son. And when I've actually read it and seen some of the du'as in it, it is amazing, absolutely amazing. You can tell that, you know, this person was not a normal human being. You know, he was somebody else, somebody special, definitely. And when you actually look into some of the du'as, you know, that um, these imams have, have written, you know, it's like... You, 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 I can do three du'as, three sentences in the du'a, and that's where I get to finish, you know? And I'm sure many of you know that. When you do a du'a to Allah and it comes from the heart, okay, some of you may be able to be a little bit more creative, let's say, um, if that's the right word to use. But at the end of the day, when you see these du'as, you know somebody special has, has written them, you know, definitely. So, yeah, that, that, that was just an amazing event in my life that helped to convince me even more. You uh, the first time you, you heard Dua Khomeil when you, when you watched it, it says that I was... Yeah, Dua Khomeil, subhanAllah. You know, um, again, Salva, bless her, she took me down to um, the Islamic Centre of England um, in Maida Vale, and they have a huge screen that they do Dua Khomeil in English subtitles. And so hearing it, um, me and another sister um, Anissa, she came uh, um, with me and we we sat and listened to this du'a for the first time. Amazing. You know, we both cried at the same point. And I knew from then, that I think was my pinnacle, um, if that's the right word to use. It was my turning point where I knew that this was definitely, definitely the right path. Because when you hear du'a khamel and the translation is nowhere near what Arabic is. I understand some Arabic and I do know that the English translation is quite bland to what it truly is, but even that in the English translation is amazing. It's like, wow, nobody, nobody can do a du'a like that, I'm telling you. You've got to hear it to, to, to actually um, 
understand it. And subhanAllah, it was, it, it's a dua that's impossible for a normal human being to do, definitely. See, don't say I don't do it. That's <laughs> <laughs> only in, in high heel lady shoes. No, I, I don't know, growing up as a Muslim, there's never been something foreign to me, to be honest. It's like, I'm born a Muslim, but most other Muslims around me see me as uh, a newcomer, you know, all the time. And there's a little bit, um, people are surprised to see that I'm a Muslim in the first place. This is like when I'm a Sunni Muslim, uh, I think up until the age of 20, 21, about a year ago, two years ago maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, for about 20 years just, you know, uh, talking. I think mostly I grew up with uh, Wahhabis and uh, seeing like their harsh views on Islam and uh, they used to bring the trousers above the ankles and a really long scruffy beard they, they used to have, you know? And, uh, Sorry. Yeah, basically that's the image I used to have and I used to have the image that um, like if you don't have a beard then that's like a really bad thing. Like that's the main thing of Islam basically is a beard and the small nitty gritty things over you know, the main things, which is your personality, you know, your kindness towards others, that kind of thing. Until uh, I came, you know, to the path of Ahlul Bayt through my, my mother. When my mum told me that she was looking into Shiism and she wants to become a Shia, I got a bit angry, you know, thinking, why all of a sudden, you know, you're becoming a Shia? And she slowly uh, showed me all the truths, blatantly in front of my eyes, I couldn't deny it, you know. And I was in a bit of a state of um, confusion. Like oh, everything I've learned up until the age of 21, everything I knew to be my Islam, all of a sudden changed, you know? And uh, I was in a bit of denial, you know, I, I felt a bit uncomfortable, but I couldn't deny the truths in front of me of, you know, some, some I, of the I took you to um, Sakina Trust as well, and you spoke to Sheikh Ayyub, do you yeah. remember? Yeah, Sheikh you, Ayyub. He answered well. a lot of questions. Yeah, he answered a lot of questions, definitely. As a white person, Usually when I go into mosques and that, you can you, you feel it a little bit, you know, um, people, not all people Asians, not all Asians are racist, but some, you know, and you get that bit of uncomfortability. They don't, they're not as friendly towards you or they won't teach you as much, you know. But with the Shias, they're very friendly, you know, um, willing to answer any questions at all. My first reaction, I was very shocked that, um, you, you see, all of the Imams are, are killed off, you know, and you think to yourself, why aren't we taught this as Sunnis? It's, it's a bit crazy, you know? And uh, that just, that was a major shock to me because um, all my friends, when I was talking to them about that, they didn't understand or they didn't want to know. And the scholars that, you know, I'd ask, you know, why aren't we taught this? They say, in case you become a Shia, which isn't a very good excuse, you know? And uh, I think there was one talk I went down to, uh, I'm not too sure of the Sheikh's name. Hilly. Uh, Hilly, yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I thought that this, these people are crying, you know, it's, uh, I couldn't see myself crying at all, but when you go down there and you hear the talk of what happened to Hussein, it, something comes over you, you know, it's like, you can't help but cry, you know, uh, so... That in itself was a bit of a shocker, but you know that's, that's fine. We're quite close, yeah, very close. We talk to her about everything basically. It's the same, uh, vice versa. Yeah. Anything she knows, she'll tell me, and that's where I get all my knowledge from, mostly. I do, I do a little bit of self research here and there, but not not as much as my mum. You know? From what she's achieved, she's brought quite a few people. Uh, to Shiism, but you know, obviously Allah is the one that guides, but my mouth has been used as a tool, which is, you know, a very good, very good thing. More crowd either. <laughs> <laughs> Good, Fine, okay. huh? Just a bit.